I think architecture school permanently broke my brain. Ever since those deadlines, the late nights in studios, and those traumatizing all-nighters, I've had the same recurring nightmare for years. And apparently, I'm not the only one. If you're anything like me, you'll know what I mean. According to experts, hurry sickness is a common illness today. The term was coined by cardiologist Mayor Freeman and Ray Roseman, who noticed that a lot of their heart disease patients had a very common character trait. They were in a constant rush. Hurry sickness is defined as a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness, an overwhelming continual sense of urgency, a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time, and so tends to perform every task faster, and they get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. My thesis project was not only focused on architecture, but it was also a investigation into this phenomena of speed and distraction and how it's affected our culture of learning and our places of learning. Instead of trying to condense everything into one 10 minute video, I've opted for the unpopular solution, break up the concepts into a series of videos. If you want the whole picture of the thesis project, you will have to watch the whole series and I'll leave the playlist right here. Thanks to technology, we're able to do everything much faster. Instead of walking, we can drive. Instead of calling, we can text. And why would you even bother going through an entire book when you can just control F? I think with time being so intertwined with a monetary value, society has come to treat productivity and efficiency as one of a person's most important traits. When you think about it, it's kind of ironic. Technology is designed to increase efficiency, so therefore it's designed to give us more time and therefore increase the quality of our lives. But instead of giving us more time to think and relax, it's kind of bred a global push towards productivity. However, when we're productive enough, when we cut up and save up enough time, we're rewarded with free time, or what we call leisure. Leisure is defined as time when one is not working or occupied. Free time. Use of free time for enjoyment. Opportunity afforded by free time to do something. Although leisure is a state of mind, the modern dictionary can't define it without the incorporation of time. In fact, time has become the benefactor that affords us the opportunity to do something. We have become enslaved to time, where even the most personal of concepts, such as leisure, have become commodified into multi-million dollar industries. This constant acceleration has led to this problem of distraction and ultimately has reduced the quality of our lives. Studies have found that the more you spend time in this distracted state, the more you reduce your brain's capacity to focus or reflect for long periods of time, permanently. Although the issue of speed and distraction is more prominent than ever, it's actually not such a new phenomenon in our culture. For centuries, people have been trying to find silence in the midst of all the noise. During the medieval times, priests would embark on a journey through a labyrinth 
for meditation. A labyrinth is an indirect and arduous path to a clear center and is often the longest possible route to the destination. The paths are non-linear, inefficient, and often disorienting, but they have one route from entrance to the center and without the possibility for false options. And these paths are used to reach a contemplative state without the fear of getting lost. The idea of a labyrinth is a contradiction in the era of speed, where we always try to find the shortest and the most efficient route possible. The term labyrinth and maze is often used interchangeably. However, the two raise different ideas. A maze has a complex branching of paths with possibilities for different routes and dead ends. A maze is designed to deceive its walkers, misleading them into multiple directions, and potentially instills a higher sense of uncertainty and confusion than a labyrinth. So I have no idea where I am right now. <laughs> We've been walking for about 20 minutes and <laughs> we're kind of back where we were before. <laughs> you can see the arch. In both a labyrinth and a maze, we're comforted by the knowledge that we will eventually reach the end, which allows us to become intentionally lost. And this kind of offers a way out from the chaos that we experience a lot of the times. I have a pretty hard time articulating this feeling. I'm going to read you an excerpt that I've modified and adopted from one of my favorite books, Larry's Party by Carol Shields. I hadn't anticipated the sensation of being unplugged from the world. Without thinking, I slowed my pace, willing myself to be lost, to be alone. Here in this labyrinth, getting lost and then found seemed like the whole point. I observed how my feet chose each wrong turning, turning against my navigational instincts, circling and repeating, and bringing on a feverish detachment. I think we've been here before. Venice is a network of canals and a network of streets which span and intersect each other. Therefore, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, but a zigzag that ramifies its tortuous optional routes. This is from the book Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino, where he describes a conversation between Marco Polo and Genghis Khan, where Marco Polo is describing all of these fictional cities, but actually he's just talking about Venice. The experience of walking through Venice is composed of two fundamental sensations, of compression and of release. We experience compression in these narrow alleys and we move towards our only clue, which is the light at the end of the tunnel, which is also a promise towards an opening. Maybe it'll lead to another alley, it might lead to an even narrower alley, 
or it might lead to a small square. Despite the discomfort that we might feel, we're no longer really in control and we have to surrender to the environment. The release offers us a sense of relief. We finally enter this open space with everything in front of our eyes and we can finally see our surroundings and we can see people again. You ready for the big expansion? It's brighter and it's safer. And the contrast between the narrow alley makes it seem like a larger space. And then we enter the alley again and this dichotomy continues on and on. Frank Lloyd Wright used this method a lot in his designs. He would encourage you to move through in the compression spaces while creating this moment of pause and the significant release in these larger spaces. We kind of go from the unknown to the known. When I visited Venice for the first time, I'd made this really long list of places that I wanted to visit, but I was confronted with people and books telling me over and over and over again that I need to experience Venice just the way it was designed to wander without a particular destination. And that's basically what I did. In fact, there's a term for this, and it was coined by Guy Debord in 1967 and the Situationist movement. And the Situationists were these group of avant-garde revolutionaries. They were known for their critique of advanced capitalism and their fight for individual expression. And they were also known for their long walks. They coined this term called the derive, which directly translates into drifting. They define derive as an unplanned, unexpected passage through an urban landscape where participants stop their daily routines and allow themselves to be drawn by the attractions of the terrain and the encounters that they find there. The Situationist Internationals used Venice as their ideal site for experimentation. They would drift through these narrow streets and follow their senses. And through its unpredictable network of streets, alleys and dead ends, canals and bridges, the derive became a journey through ambient space and ambient intensities for navigation through the labyrinth and city. And it becomes a really powerful strategy in slowing down your pace. Thank you for watching my very first attempt at turning my very complex thesis into a short video. This is just the beginning of the process. So if you are interested and if you want to continue on the journey, make sure you subscribe. And the next video is going to come out next month. So I will leave that video right here. Otherwise, if you want to keep updated with what I'm doing, I have a monthly newsletter. I'll leave the link to join in the description box. And this type of video is not sponsored. The production cost is coming out of my own pocket. And this type of video I know performs really poorly on YouTube analytics. But right now I'm really interested in exploring this bridge between architecture and filmmaking. If you enjoyed this video, I would greatly appreciate it if you try to generate some buzz around it, like share it, comment on it, donate to it by clicking on the super thanks. Let me know your thoughts, your genuine thoughts down in the comments. So let me know if you want to see the rest of the series. And if not, that's okay. And with that, I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Thank you.